The following is a collection of reflections gleaned over several months in my role as Deputy State Treasurer for the state of Illinois, a state that has the fifth highest economic output in our union and reinforced by my upbringing in poverty on the south side of Chicago and in working low-wage jobs in my formative years as a young worker. The impact has been severe and widespread. Public health crisis, short-term food shortages, rising unemployment, loan defaults. The very fabric of our society is at peril. It has exposed issues of race and ethnicity, of age and class inequality within our humanity. Our economy and the people within it are not immune to these challenges. Just as a pandemic has exposed the inequities within our civic society, it is also revealing deep risks within our local economies. Restaurants are fighting for their survival. Schools and other places of learning are inaccessible. And many theaters are at risk of permanently closing their doors. Our state and local governments face significant revenue shortfalls as a result of reduced consumer consumption, increased unemployment, and diminished economic activity. The conclusion? Our state's revenue will fall somewhere between $2 billion this fiscal year and more than $8 billion in the next several years, depending on the severity of the recession. This will inevitably impact critical services such as our parks, our roads, and our schools. An engine of the U.S. economy, small businesses are driving on fumes. Not only do they generate half of U.S. economic output, but they generate two-thirds of net new jobs. Small business is literally everybody's business. They are interwoven into the fabric of our local communities. For example, there is Larry. He's one of the many small businesses that I've interacted with over the last several weeks. He has been cooking up cuisine for the past 30 years and devoting his sweat and tears during past downturns. In the past month though, he's had to close his doors, lay off two dozen staff, negotiate rent deferment, and figure out if the government's small business rescue plan is going to help him. The gut-wrenching decisions weigh on him. How to provide for his family, how to protect his employees, and how his business can endure in the long term. And nearly every other small business in the U.S. is in the same set of shoes, whether it's the restaurants, truckers, the suppliers, or the growers. Multiplied by the thousands, this helps illustrate how the pandemic has triggered the worst recession in nearly a century, as the initial blows on both individuals and small businesses ripple out into the masses. The speed and scope of this downturn is significantly worse than any recession since World War II. A recent Fed survey estimated that of families making less than 40,000 a year, I repeat, of less than 40,000 a year, ladies and gentlemen, a whopping 40% have said they have someone that has recently lost a job since February. This means our citizens who are most in need bearing the brunt of this economic shutdown. It has put the cost of not having a social safety net front and center. Case in point, Debbie. She was introduced to me by one of my employees. She is 59 years old proud mother of four and works at a meatpacking plant, taking that early morning drive time and time again for the past 15 years. Today though, she feels ill. She has a headache, fever, difficulty breathing, body aches, sinuses, her eyes hurt. However, she's unable to take any time off. Her husband was recently laid off. These are the decisions that are being contemplated daily. The lives lost under COVID-19, and the lives lost under an economic shutdown. These low-wage workers, the backbone of our society, they're not working from home. No, they've been laid off from affected industries or they're performing critical tasks, which means they're highly more susceptible to getting sick. Yet we, as a society, cannot survive long without them. In the city of Chicago alone, there's approximately 1.3 million workers that tend to work in sectors that pay hourly wages. Think retail, restaurants, manufacturing, warehouses, 
arts and entertainment, just to name a few. Altogether, these sectors comprise about 60% of Chicago's workforce, yet these sectors are the ones that are most at risk, do not have any paid time off, and they are more susceptible to loss of income, whether temporary or permanent. The Chicago region has the fifth highest economic and racial segregation in the country. This is probably a statistic we've all heard before, but it is of critical importance now. Why? Although many people will suffer as a result of this pandemic, people of color are particularly vulnerable. Our response must be swift yet equitable. Otherwise, issues of segregation and inequality will only be exacerbated. Just as COVID-19 has ravaged African-American and Latino neighborhoods due to chronic health disparities, job and wage losses are hitting African-American and Latino families the worst. Then there is Linda. She's one of my constituents. She's a Latino store associate at a neighborhood store. Linda does not have health insurance, and now her work hours have been reduced too. She doesn't have the luxury of having her groceries delivered to her. No, as a matter of fact, she's the one stacking the shelves. So not only is Linda more stressed than ever financially, but now she's at heightened risk of contracting the virus, or even worse, dying from it. Not to mention the lack of transportation and lack of childcare that she's also confronted with. You know, 61% of Latinos and 44% of African Americans recently stated in a survey that was conducted in April that they themselves or someone in their household have suffered job or wage losses as a result of the coronavirus outbreak compared to 38% of their white counterparts. Ladies and gentlemen, the response to the pandemic is being crippled by the same issues that have impacted many of our lives. Growing income inequality, the rise of misinformation, lack of trust in institutions, the rural-urban divide, and hyperpartisanship. This is neither a democratic nor a republican issue. This is neither a rural nor a urban issue. This is neither a us nor a them issue. This is an issue of humanity. We cannot let this threat drive us apart. What we do moving forward will dictate the forthcoming future. Just like the period following the Great Recession, the current economic recovery is serving the well-to-do and the wealthy. Although we've enacted more than $3 trillion in government stimulus and more than $3 trillion in monetary stimulus, six trillion altogether, the resulting recovery is benefiting those with capital. The glaring disconnect between the real economy of workers with jobs and bills to pay and the investor economy of investors with stocks and bonds is one of those most stark issues of this time. We must be the change that we seek. We must use this crisis to think bigger. We must recapitalize underserved enterprises with flexible, low-cost sources of capital. We must foster local economies with the structures to support them. And we must employ strategies that promote sustainable economic activity. That is why, in my role here at the Treasury, for the fifth largest state, with a economic output similar to that of the Netherlands, I propose the five following economic systems innovations in order to help build the foundations necessary to expand the recovery to broad swaths of society. Number one, access to capital. Small businesses in underserved areas are a powerful economic engine, generating wealth and creating jobs in areas where resources are scarce. Entrepreneurship is a potent tool to help close the long-standing wealth gap. Just as COVID-19 threatens to permanently shutter many small businesses, we need to consider and adopt policies that promote flexible, low-cost sources of capital from nimble institutions, such as community banks, credit unions, community development corporations, community development financial institutions, micro-lenders, and community land trusts, to name a few. As such, Businesses such as Larry's Restaurant will have access to capital and not just those big businesses with the resources and the relationships. 
Number two, publicly supported financial institutions. Just like we have food deserts, we have banking deserts. We have entire neighborhoods that don't have access to affordable basic banking services, much less access to capital. These neighborhoods have been deemed not profitable or not profitable enough, which is the reason why state and city supported financial institutions are a key to bridge this gap and boosting banking services and available capital to people like Larry that are not being well served by traditional financial institutions. Number three, employee owned enterprises. These are businesses that are owned and governed by their employees. They tend to share two common characteristics. Member owners invest and own these businesses and they share in the enterprise's profits. And since many of the workers are residents of the community, they tend to employ sustainable business practices that do not harm people like Debbie. And the profits, they stay and recirculate within the local economy. Number four, complementary currencies. They are a tool for community economic empowerment and development towards self-reliance. They help maximize the flow of goods, services, and capital within a predefined region, thereby strengthening a local economy. Commonplace in the early 1900s, they are once again being recognized as a tool for local economic development. When a individual makes a conscious commitment to buy local, they are taking an interest in their community and in people like Linda, thereby helping create the foundations for a truly vibrant local economy. And lastly, stakeholder capitalism. If there is a positive consequence resulting from this pandemic, it is the acceleration of the shift to stakeholder capitalism and away from the singular emphasis on shareholder profits. The importance of customers and suppliers, of employees and the communities in which they operate have brought forth stakeholder capitalism into sharper focus. When companies do things like increase healthcare benefits, hike pay for frontline workers, lower executive compensation in order to avert layoffs, and take additional precautions to protect their workers, like Linda, this will inevitably result in a more engaged and productive workforce and a more loyal customer base following the recovery. On a concluding note, we need to drive towards a more fair, free, just, and equitable society. The work is more important than ever now. We need to work together in partnership to rebuild our communities and address the historical and structural inequities that have persisted in our society in light of the new and evolving challenges that lay ahead. And if we don't, it may be the imminent last straw that finally breaks this great American experiment of ours. Thank you.